everyone. I'm Dan Lucaser, and I'm happy to be giving you this overview of assessment and treatment of thyroid dysfunction in anticipation of the virtual hormone APM. I just want to note that I've hidden a number of references and further studies so that you can review those at your leisure. What I want to do here is analyze the causes, recognize the symptoms, and clarify the laboratory evaluations that are useful, and then develop a plan for thyroid dysfunction. In other words, what do we need? We know that causes the thyroid to go awry. How do you recognize it clinically? How should you test? And then how do you treat short of hormone replacement therapy and botanical medicines? And other pharmaceuticals. So that will all be covered in the advanced practice module. But first, let's sketch out the extent of the problem. And uh, thyroid dysfunction affects men and women of every age, race, and socioeconomic status. And estimates actually vary in the US and elsewhere. It's likely that at the very least, one to two percent of Americans have pronounced hypothyroidism, and 10%, maybe even 15%, have subclinical or mild hypothyroidism. In addition, we know that 10 to 12 percent of the adult population has elevated autoantibodies to the thyroid. Um, and this number of people with thyroid disease, hypothyroid, now surpasses the number of people diagnosed with diabetes or heart disease. We'll primarily be talking here about low thyroid function or dysfunction. Again, hypothyroid dysfunction, maybe one in eight of uh, adults in the United States. It's more prevalent because in part, as Jeff Bland, the founder of IFM has said, the thyroid is the sentinel gland for the environment. In other words, the thyroid gland is exquisitely sensitive to environmental stimuli. As far as we know, every cell in the body has thyroid receptors and therefore is affected by thyroid hormones. And the manifestations of these can be profound or subtle, as described in most standard textbooks, one of which I've quoted here, hypothyroidism can affect all organ systems. These manifestations are largely independent of the underlying disorder, but are a function of the degree of hormone deficiency, which means it's a continuum, which is an important point to make. When you have decreased thyroid function, your overall metabolic gas pedal slows down because the master gland that controls it, that is your thyroid gland, isn't functioning at full speed. If your thyroid slows down, every other organ and system in your body slows down, including your brain, your heart, your digestive tract, the muscles. The uh, thyroid hormone is kind of like a master switch that turns on the genes that keep every cell running. This is one of those gray areas in medicine, but conventional medicine tends to think in black and white. You have it or you don't, uh, kind of like being pregnant, but it's not quite like that. It's more like the engine in a car and certain parts of that engine can be affected. Uh, that engine runs best when properly tuned and there's all sorts of gradations of being out of tune. It can sputter, you can get poor gas mileage, etc. And so it's quite clear, hopefully, as that analogy suggests, that different people manifest the hormone deficiency with different symptoms. And what are some of those effects? Well, it can run the gamut and appears quite individualized, where the signal in one tissue or another isn't getting through unless you have a multiplicity of symptoms that are different for each individual because different tissues are affected from one individual to the other. We see that going around our matrix model, we can name the various 
physiological systems it affects, as you can see here. But first, let's look at what we know about anisines, triggers, and mediators. That is our first objective, which is what do we know that causes the thyroid to go awry? I want to give you a foundation on what antecedents, triggers, and mediators you want to consider. In general, what I'm trying to have you keep in mind when someone comes into your office is what you think is the primary issue of hormone dysregulation, that is, why? So let's talk first about stress. We talk about stress in detail in other parts of the program, but how does stress affect the thyroid? We know this path really, this pathway, I think, TRH stimulates TSH, which stimulates the production of T4, and T4 is converted by deionase enzyme action to T3. As we've been emphasizing, when you talk about stress, we start with the adrenals. How does stress and cortisol secretion affect the adrenals? Well, the thyroid is often affected by adrenal dysfunction, specifically elevations in cortisol. Here is where we see CRH and cortisol inhibits TRH, TSH, and T3, which results in increased levels of reverse T3, as I showed, and we'll discuss later. So the important point to make here is that we can improve thyroid metabolism whether a person is on hormone replacement or not. So in summary here, stress in its many guises has, has been shown to suppress TRH, uh, TSH, and thyroid hormones. Just another article really from a wealth of research pointing towards increased cortisol levels affecting thyroid function. So do your patients who are stressed have cold hands and feet and other symptoms that you think of as hypothyroid? Well, you should think upstream and you should think about the adrenals as that might be where the problem lies hypercortisolemia. Next, we need to understand how inflammation in its many manifestations and infections play a role in thyroid dysfunction. So we looked at stress itself, but the process of inflammation can push the adrenal axis also. With inflammation, we can uh, get increased production of inflammatory cytokines as shown here. These cytokines act in much the same way as a stressful psychological event does. Cytokines increase CRH, ACTH, and cortisol that all in turn block conversion of T4 to T3. Additionally, inflammatory cytokines can also bind to the thyroid peroxidase enzymes, thyroglobulin, and TSH receptors and thus prevent the manufacture of T4 itself that you can see at the bottom center. Here is just some literature to support the concept. This study looked at patients with fibromyalgia showing inflammatory cytokines associated with depressed levels of the active thyroid hormone T3. What you need to know is that inflammation downregulates thyroid metabolism. And so perhaps the first point of leverage is that really any and all lifestyle interventions, that bottom of the matrix model, will improve conversion of T4 to T3 by virtue of really mitigating inflammation. Let's now talk about the idea of the infective hypothesis in the pathogenesis of autoimmune thyroid disease. What about infections like EBV? Well, EBV has been clearly associated in the onset of autoimmune thyroiditis, as are various other viruses whose references I've hidden in a couple of slides that you'll see. 
So, but bacterial infections as well in the specific form of Yersinia and Borrelia here have also been implicated. So there are many more connections with infections as I've alluded to. The question that I think we need to ask is after the infection has been cleared, the EBV, the, um, the, uh, the bacterial infection, or even a specific toxicant that has come and gone, let's say, is there a feed forward process that, that continues? So much of the literature suggests that with infections like EBV and herpes and H. pylori and various others, it is likely that the original infection has started the uh, autoimmune process, but it is then on a feed forward loop and is not the trigger any longer. Um, so in some ways, uh, this process has started and it now has its own ongoing loop or cycle. So as this picture tries to show, the cat is out of the bag, which is probably the wrong analogy. It's more like the horse has left the barn. Sometimes we can find and address the underlying cause and sometimes that underlying cause is on that feed forward cycle. So we can't necessarily address it specifically. Well, but here's an example of when we can and I think we need to look. So this is a case report of eradication of Blastocystis hominis and resolution of a case of Hashimoto's. So I think it's important to keep an open mind and change what you can. What we can and are doing often is not necessarily always discovering the underlying cause, but in many ways improving the system and optimizing function. How about dietary and nutritional issues in thyroid dysfunction? Let's talk about these, gluten, gorgogens, low calorie diet, nutritional insufficiencies. So first let's look at diet and gluten. As noted in this study, uh, celiac disease is a significant risk for autoimmune thyroid disease. Therefore, a point I will make is that when you suspect autoimmune thyroiditis, always test for celiac disease. The chance of celiac increases one's risk for both thyroid dysfunction and AIT in this study by about threefold. What is even more impressive in this same study is that the celiac disease patients with thyroid issues, there are 19 patients, if they stayed off gluten, they recovered uh, from their autoimmune thyroiditis. Um, even if they, um, uh, well, I would say if they had either AIT or non-AIT, um, and those that uh, didn't uh, um, recover weren't really off gluten. They, uh, they weren't able to get off gluten and so their compliance was poor. Here's a more recent uh, study and that was a threefold risk. And this is a larger study looking at over 14,000 individuals showed an even higher four to six fold increased risk of autoimmune thyroiditis with celiac disease. So the clinical bottom line, I think, if a patient has one autoimmune disease, you need to suspect another. And of course, we need to be aware of the myriad nutrient deficiencies that can result from celiac disease. It may be in part that these nutrient deficiencies that celiac disease causes may be extenuating complications in thyroid dysfunction. Therefore, there are a number of nutrients that play a critical role in thyroid function that we'll talk about later that there may be uh, overlap here. Um, some newer studies actually implicate non-celiac wheat sensitivity with autoimmune thyroiditis. This is very interesting, uh, but to be clear, there are no studies that show if these individuals with non-celiac gluten sensitivity or non-wheat, uh, non-celiac wheat sensitivity go off gluten, they resolve their autoimmune thyroiditis as shown in that celiac disease presentation. So all we can say is there is an association here. Let's move on to goitrogens and soy in particular. There have long been questions about the ingestion of soy and the effects on thyroid function. You can Google this and find all sorts of things. 
we know that certain phytochemicals in foods do have inhibitory effects on thyroid function. These are, of course, called goitrogens, which are found in soy and, if in fact, found in cruciferous vegetables. In fact, there are studies uh, in some animal and in vitro models that suggest that soy and the isoflavones found in soy do inhibit the production of thyroid hormones. And so this has raised a lot of concerns about the effects in humans. However, what happens in a test tube or even in an animal can't always be extrapolated to humans. It seems like it's more complex than that. One thing that's confusing about this issue are some other actions of soy. As this study suggests, soy, as with other foods, can cause poor absorption of prescribed thyroid hormones. For this reason, thyroid hormones, uh, thyroid medications, as we know, should be taken separately from food. This has really been known for quite some time. However, you'd be surprised sometimes when you ask uh, your, your patients on thyroid medications if they're taking it away from food. But as this study shows here, it's not always so clear, and at least with the isoflavone and not the bolus of soy protein, there is no change in bioavailability in this study. However, to be on the safe side, I always suggest, and I think we always should suggest to take thyroid hormones away from um, soy or food in general. So if you rule out absorption issues, how about the idea of soy acting as a goitrogen? There have been a number of human studies looking at soy's effects on the thyroid. So in longer term and controlled human studies, soy generally does not seem to have a clinically significant effect. These are quotes from three human studies. They're now a bit older. I've given you the studies and specifics in some uh, following hidden slides. This is a review now, um, a, a bit older, but uh, it did review uh, 14 human trials uh, published, and there was either no effects or only very modest changes noted. Um, the authors uh, went on to talk about the theoretical increased risk of soy promoting an iodine deficiency and suggesting soy consumers make sure their iodine intake was adequate. Adequate. So we'll talk about that a bit later as well. Even actually more recently than that review, this uh, longer-term double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial, which lasted three years, longer than anyone had done before, and certainly longer than those earlier studies that I just mentioned, uh, stated that uh, genistein aglycone intake, which is a phytochemical found in soy, does not significantly increase the risk of clinical subclinical hypothyroidism at a dose, which is a pretty high dose of 54 milligrams per, per day. So that should be the end of it. Uh, but of course, there are always shades of gray in medicine. Uh, so a study uh, after that one just gave us some pause. And this study essentially said that a small subset of individuals may be soy sensitive and it would affect their thyroid. And actually, as I highlighted here, the study also showed that soy had positive effects on decreasing blood pressure and inflammation as measured by HSCRP and insulin resistance. So we're, we're left here, I guess, uh, as is often the case with some gray in, uh, in this uh, understanding of soy and thyroid. So, um, uh, you know, I would say that uh, um, you should make sure that uh, uh, iodine is replete. You should be cautious in people with a history of thyroiditis or on a poor diet that may be marginally deficient in iodine. But really, for the broad majority of individuals, normal dietary soy is unlikely to have uh, any long-term negative effects on thyroid function. Um, I would say also, as an aside, that uh, you know this issue that I raised with uh, cruciferous vegetables, uh, brassicas, and goitrogens, there is no data that I've seen to support the limitation on uh, brassicas, cruciferous vegetables like broccoli. I think. This is really a non-issue, unless, of course, you're doing something like a 30-day cabbage fast or something like that, then you might want to think about it. 
How about uh, caloric restriction? As I showed you before, stress, cortisol affects T3 and reverse T3. So diet extremes are a form of psych uh, physiological stress, I would say. A, a low calorie intake at uh, this level shown has uh, caused or can cause central hypothyroidism with elevated reverse T3 levels causing low active T3. So long-term dieters often ex can experience the adverse effects of um, you know, starvation, which is related to in part to thyroid function. So they may have you know, fatigue, hair loss, and muscle weakness. Um, so if you're trying to lose weight, restricting calories can do that. Can do that. In this study, 20% restriction. Um, so you do need to be careful long term. I think in a long term restriction, its effect on thyroid metabolism. But can exercise do that? The question: uh, Can exercise affect the thyroid adversely? Um, and the answer here appears to be no. Um, so extreme dietary restriction should perhaps be avoided if you have some thyroid concerns. Um, but uh, um, you know, normal exercise, I think, uh, doesn't have significant effects on the thyroid. So what about key nutrients to consider in uh, thyroid regula uh, regulation? Um, what are they? What's the evidence? Uh, why are they important? Um, so let's briefly review and start with selenium. The thyroid actually is the organ with the highest amount of selenium per gram of tissue, and selenium is a cofactor in deionation of T4 to T3. It's a deionase enzyme uh, that I've mentioned and will mention again. Uh, and selenium is also a cofactor in glutathione peroxidase, which is an antioxidant that is, appears to be particularly important to thyroid activity. And I show a, uh, a ratio that's been associated with this deficiency. We'll uh, come back to that ratio. And so one can certainly talk about clinical experience, and we should, and I do. But this is not an end one. There, this is a well-studied uh, phenomenon. So um, a, a number of uh, studies uh, have a positive effect or have shown selenium to have a positive effect on autoimmune thyroiditis. I mentioned this uh, deionase enzyme conversion, but well, what are we talking about here? Well, here schematically is the enzyme involved in the conversion of T4 to T3, that deionase enzyme, uh, where selenium and actually zinc also are cofactors. Uh, um, and it's, it's a critically important potential bottleneck. It blocks that conversion and can leave one functionally hypothyroid. I'll come back to this because I think it is very important. So uh, as I said, selenium is high in the thyroid gland. Um, it's a, a cofactor in antioxidant glutathione, glutathione peroxidase. You've heard of glutathione, of course. Um, so selenium is an important catalyst there. There are a number of studies that suggest Higher selenium intake is correlated with lower antibody and TSH levels, suggesting it's important for overall function of the thyroid gland. Um, and there are enough studies in this area that we have multiple meta-analysis. Uh, there are positive meta-analysis with subjective improvement, uh, with the only change being uh, selenium uh, supplementation. Um, however, really most of the professional medical societies don't support the use of selenium or in fact any other supplement and they're kind of dueling meta-analyses and this one, this Cochrane meta-analysis, says the data is incomplete and not reliable to help inform clinical decision making. But this meta-analysis done after that one said not so fast as both antibodies drop with selenium supplementation. It just takes a while. Uh, six to 12 months. Um, and uh, again, what does selenium appear to be doing? It's likely upregulating glutathione peroxidase, which as mentioned, is an important antioxidant specific to the thyroid. 
And this uh, more even more recent meta-analysis 2016 also gave a positive review on the use of selenium. Um, while there's certainly not unanimity in the field, I guess uh, what field is there unanimity in? Um, and given the low toxicity of 200 micrograms of selenium, I supplement regularly. You can note here that the data suggests a particular kind of selenium, selenomethionine, was used and more effective than selenium, uh, sodium selenate. And um, even in patients on HRT, hormone replacement therapy, uh, thyroid hormone replacement therapy, you should supplement as it's beneficial. So it's not either or, it's an integrated overall approach. Are many people deficient or at least insufficient in selenium? Well, yes, and why? Well, it's because it's often not in the food we eat. As this graph shows, in various parts of the US at least, the soil is simply deficient. So the idea of eating locally is a good one, but it's a bit complicated as well. And uh, so even if you eat well, you might have a selenium deficiency or other mineral deficiencies, as I'll talk about. And fortunately, topsoil erosion is a culprit here. And so in, in uh, some areas of the country, uh, much of the topsoil is gone. So we need to think about uh, supplementation. So let's move on to zinc. Zinc can have, uh, well, can help normalize free T3 and decrease reverse T3, um, as this uh, data shows here. This is likely the role, uh, the result of zinc's role as a cofactor for the thyroid receptor. Again, let's note this is not a short time frame. This is 12 months. So this is a long-term lifestyle change, either um, with food or a supplement for zinc, as I said about selenium. Here we see studies that low intake of zinc may be implicated because it is a cofactor for the thyroid receptor to operate properly and also conversion of T4 to T3. Zinc is important for conversion of beta carotene to vitamin A. I'm gonna come back to that later because uh, that can also be important when we talk about uh, vitamin A and its importance in thyroid function. Here you can see trials in which they, uh, zinc and selenium in this case, were used together to benefit. And again, you see this ratio, which again, I will come back to. So we, we see here a synergistic effect in you need to do these, or you often need to do these uh, nutrients together. They're more effective as a team, and they seem to have a modulatory effect here on heavy metals, in this case, cadmium, although uh, note that uh, this is uh, an animal study, so I'm extrapolating from an animal study. Um, <clears throat> um, but uh, let's move on now uh, to iron. And we know that iron is particularly important uh, as a nutrient in thyroid function. And data actually suggests that women who are hypothyroid are more likely to be iron deficient. And iron sufficiency improves the production of thyroid hormones because it's a cofactor of thyroid peroxidase, which is the enzyme that produces T4. As we stated, uh, as is stated here, it seems to indirectly improve the efficacy of iodine. So again, just like that zinc selenium connection I made, it, it's not surprising that these nutrients work together, kind of uh, like systems biology, kind of like um, a lot of things. So you see um, where this iron-dependent enzyme, uh, thyroid peroxidase, comes into play, bringing iodine into the cell where it makes T4. What's the mechanism along with catalyzing TPO? Iron seems to improve thyroid function by decreasing the conversion to reverse T3 and increasing production of T4 to T3.
but there are likely other mechanisms as well. And there's now research on measuring ferritin levels in the normal range, but less than 100 supplementing with iron and finding symptom relief in hypothyroid patients. So in one small study, they found that if they restored serum ferritin to above 100 micrograms per liter, symptoms improved even in women on a stable dose of T4. Here again, together with iron, T4 works better. So, I mean, how many of you supplement iron with, uh, with a ferritin of you know, 75? And, uh, a few years ago, I was uh, using my cutoff as much above the uh, kind of reference range, which is generally 10 to 200, much above, above that reference range of 10, I was supplementing with a reference range of 50 uh, or lower. Now I'm aiming uh, for a reference range above 100 in those thyroid uh, uh, compromised patients. And now we come to iodine, which is a bit more complicated. Uh, iodine is a mineral with a significant effect on thyroid function. However, its use has become somewhat controversial. It's a situation uh, that Goldilocks uh, found herself in. Not too much, not too little, not too little, just right. And uh, a better analogy for iodine might be this double-edged sword analogy I use here. At higher levels, it can be of issue as well as low levels. So we need to be very careful with iodine. And I think there is a segment of the medical community that thinks high dose iodine is the answer. I really don't think uh, that's supported by the literature. I don't think uh, often there's one thing that is the answer. So NHANES data, uh, supports uh, the idea that um, iodine may be low. This is U.S. data, but it does show iodine was low in 15% of women of childbearing age. Um, and uh, it's uh, iodine deficiency um, uh, uh, is something you do need to watch for in some select population. This article suggests that vegetarians and vegans should be careful because they are more likely to be iodine uh, deficient. Additionally, uh, significant or prolonged vigorous exercise can have an effect. So it's only a clue, not a warning. I think most people really aren't getting too much exercise, um, but exercise, the vigorous exercise can affect iodine over the long term. So I've shown that low iodine can lead to thyroid dysfunction, but also high, as I alluded to. As noted here, we have great physiological resiliency around iodine intake. We can grab onto it very readily, and if in overabundance, we've developed mechanisms to excrete excessive iodine when it's excessively available. Uh, we are really this amazing adaptable machine uh, that in this regards, and actually in other regards as well, when you think about how we can adapt to burning uh, ketones versus glucose, um, it, we're really amazing. Um, however, as noted here, although excess iodine exposure generally does not result in any apparent clinical consequences, thyroid dysfunction can occur in vulnerable patients with specific risk factors. So epidemiological studies showed that thyroid antibodies and autoimmune hypothyroidism are more common in areas with iodine supplementation versus deficient area, uh, areas, which kind of illustrates the law of unintended consequences. And how do we know what is too much? Here is data that suggests a range uh, of uh, too little and too much, and it's in line with the World Health Organization recommendation of 100 to 300 micrograms per liter. Therefore, when I look at uh, urinary iodine, I like to see it between 100 to 300. When it's high, this may be leading to dysfunction. Uh, let me just also parenthetically mention that as, uh, I, um, and I'll talk about a little bit later, I 
I use a, a spot uh, morning urinary iodine. There is better data on a 24-hour urinary iodine. I choose to do something that I think is good enough and because uh, a 24-hour uh, urinary iodine, collecting that for 24 hours, it's just not going to happen very regularly. So while many areas seem deficient, as I mentioned, uh, many supplements have iodine and perhaps too much and the iodine content of multivitamins is not uniform. Um, in a U.S. study published about a decade ago, iodine as potassium iodide or kelp was a labeled ingredient in only about half of uh, 223 prenatal multivitamins. However, among the 25 brands containing iodine derived from kelp, uh, measured values were frequently discordant with the labeled values, including 13 brands with a 50% discrepancy between the measured and labeled values. So let's say the, and the takeaway from this for me is eating kelp occasionally is just fine. I think putting it in a supplement is probably not because you can have a, a various levels there. So I think about uh, uh, supplements with potassium iodine, which is uh, easier to measure and not kelp to use in uh, vitamin preparations. Given the risks of potential iodine-induced thyroid dysfunction, the American Thyroid Association recommends against ingestion of an iodine or kelp daily supplement containing greater than 500 micrograms of iodine for all individuals, except as they say, for certain medical indications. So I agree. Hence, we should measure and assess iodine because uh, one gives, uh, you know, one shouldn't give uh, extra when you don't need it, uh, but definitely when you need it, uh, you want to give uh, iodine. And as noted before, there appears to be a uh, intricate relationship between iodine and selenium. And thus, when you do supplement with iodine, you should include selenium as well. Again, I think the idea that we should be looking at these nutrients as part of a package is important. They're part of a team and thinking about one alone can lead to supra-physiologic doses when the team approach can accomplish, I think, more safely a better outcome. So we saw, again, zinc and selenium, iron and iodine. Um, uh, here's iodine and selenium. And here we see iron and selenium may improve the effectiveness of iodine and T4 supplementation or T4 medications. So let's move on to the vitamins. First, vitamin A, which I mentioned before. There is good literature to support the contention that first, vitamin A is important for thyroid signaling as it appears to affect T4, T3 nuclear receptor regulatory factors. <clears throat> and second, vitamin A deficiency can be implicated in thyroid dysfunction. Therefore, low levels of vitamin A intake is an issue. <clears throat> and conversion of beta carotene could also be an issue. Why might vitamin A deficiency be more prevalent than we think first? Many, many people don't take in enough, um, as I uh, mentioned with uh, selenium. Um, and second, fat malabsorption and liver disorders are likely important contributors. Uh, but there is a third reason, and that has to do with single nucleotide polymorphisms, these gene variants. Beta carotene is not automatically converted to vitamin A in everyone equally. Eating a carrot doesn't automatically mean you get vitamin A um, and your vitamin A status is sufficient. There are these gene variants that affect the conversion and there are multiple gene variants, variants multiple polymorphisms. Probably a third of us have one of these SNPs and having one of these SNPs can decrease the conversion by half. So look for vitamin A insufficiency. And in your suspected hypothyroid patients, you may want to supplement. So finally, let's look at vitamin D. 
Uh, first, there's a clear association with low levels of vitamin D and autoimmune thyroiditis. Secondly, genes again seem to play a role. Here, the VDR gene polymorphism was found to be associated with uh, autoimmune thyroid disease. And here's an interesting study uh, because they measured vitamin D as normal uh, above 30 nanograms per deciliter. I'm sure some of your labs say vitamin D is normal above 20. So even with a normal vitamin D here, when given a modest amount of additional vitamin D in this study, antibody titers went down. Therefore, with good reason, I think, I generally shoot for 50 to 80 nanograms per deciliter. I think that's evidence-based. I think there is a likelihood of benefit in many people, and there's a very low risk of harm at that level. So we see various causes of uh, vitamin D. First, just latitude. Uh, we know that above 35 degrees north latitude, um, you can see basically Atlanta across the uh, uh, northern uh, California, um, little to no vitamin D can be produced between November and February. So uh, latitude is important, but beyond that, we see various other causes of low vitamin D. Um, so how we live, aside from where we live, um, you know, indoor, sedentary, uh, skin pigment, uh, aging reduces vitamin D too much, or a lot of sunscreen lowers the intake of vitamin D. And another reason um, that I alluded to, uh, poor diets uh, are certainly important and uh, this is a real problem, surprise, surprise. Look specifically at vitamin A and vitamin D, two vitamins that I suggested are critically important to thyroid health. Only about 50% of Americans are getting the estimated average requirement for each of these. Again, a synergistic relationship um, uh, between two nutrients, at least additive, I say synergistic, but at least additive, um, in this case, uh, vitamin D and selenium. So in summary, from a supplementation standpoint, here's what I do routinely, and I think you can generally do this in one or two supplements. And here is uh, three nutrients that I test for routinely, uh, and I will often supplement at higher levels than that previous slide based upon these testing results. Although we should be thinking about, of course, dietary sources first, what are foods with high levels of selenium? Well, you know, Brazil nuts and pork and tuna and clams, or how about vitamin D? We know that fish, certain kinds of fish and cod liver oil. Um, so eating a phytonutrient diet is something we always encourage. You have these handouts available. Um, I should say phytonutrient rich diet. You have these handouts available in your IFM toolkit. So uh, food first is certainly something that we should be thinking about. Now, what about medications? Well, a lot of meds have uh, thyroid effects. And again, effects on that conversion of T4 to T3. Uh, we're talking here about inhibiting this uh, key deionase enzyme called D1. In the past, it's been called 5 prime deionase, which converts, as I mentioned, T4 to T3. Now, D2 uh, does this as well, but the main deionase in serum is D1. Pretty common medications block this conversion. PPI, very common medications, which I have, uh, which I have underlined. So, um, you know, some of these medications show up in a lot of people. Um, Here's another controversial issue in fluoride as a medication. Uh, the thyroid gland appears to be the most sensitive tissue in the body to fluoride. And while there have been a lot of hyperbole around fluoride, we do know it is an antagonist to iodine. So fluoride is able to decrease the concentration of T3 and T4, thereby producing hypothyroidism in some susceptible individuals. This was a large observational study in England, which suggested that in the US, we generally fluoridate our water. 
figuring out what that level should be is based upon a risk benefit of prevention of dental caries versus risk of skeletal fluorosis. So this study uh, um, said the optimal value was set at 0.7 milligrams per deciliter with the maximum of four based upon you know, uh, the cost benefit uh, analysis. And you've heard the term, the dose makes the poison. We should add the dose and the person uh, given that dose make the poison as there seems to be a growing body of evidence that susceptible individuals, uh, there is a dose of fluoride at much lower levels that can have or be significant uh, in uh, mediating or, or at least exacerbating thyroid issues. These two recent studies suggest that even at what appears to be optimal fluoride levels, there was an elevation in TSH. Additionally, since fluoride competes with iodine, not being iodine sufficient puts you more at risk. I'm not suggesting fluoride is completely bad. It has positive effects on dental caries, but we should personalize that treatment. Therefore, a good strategy would be in susceptible individuals, individuals that you know have thyroid dysfunction or maybe are at more risk uh, uh, from a genetic standpoint to filter their water of fluoride perhaps forego regular fluoride treatments from the dentist and make sure they are iodine sufficient. Finally, what about toxins? Uh, which I let off, uh, you know, discussing or, or uh, a quote from uh, Dr. Jeff Bland. Toxins are a primary issue in thyroid dysfunction. Uh, for decades, we've known that hundreds of industrial chemicals have been shown to result in the reduction of TSH and or T4. So many, many toxins are endocrine disruptors and the thyroid is a primary target. There certainly is significant research that says they can be an issue specifically in autoimmune thyroiditis, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenols are frequent thyroid disruptors, uh, and they're ubiquitous. There's you know, hundreds of configurations that make these PCBs, and they were banned in the United States decades ago, but they are persistent organic pollutants with the accent on the persistent. They stick around, and they are thyroid disruptors by blocking various parts of the process of production, transport, and receptor sensitivity of thyroid hormones. So going back to NHANES data, they noted a relationship between thyroid function, cadmium and lead, and a differential effect between men and women. Women appear to be more sensitive, which may in part explain the prevalence of thyroid dysfunction in women being much higher than in men. Um, and so I, you know, I talked about PCPs, I've talked about these uh, toxic mineral, minerals, uh, there are many examples of toxins that affect the thyroid. Um, as this NHANES data shows, the higher the exposure to what they term dioxin-like toxic equivalents, the lower the level of T4. The data shows a dose-dependent decrease in total T4 with exposure to these toxins. And uh, particularly troubling, uh, these were at levels similar to those found in the general U.S. population. The effects were stronger again in women, the lowest level of T4 in the highest quintile level of these toxin-like toxic equivalents, again, uh, perhaps explaining the higher uh, issues uh, um, in women uh, on autoimmune thyroiditis. And remember, we're talking about these really infinitesimally tiny levels, the current maximum contaminant, contaminant, contaminant level, as allowed by the EPA, is one half part per billion of PCBs in drinking water. Think about that. It's akin to one drop of water in a swimming pool, um, you know, one penny and $10 million, one grain of sand in a sandbox. You get the point. Very, very tiny amounts can have significant effects. So many studies, some I've hinted, hidden on toxic effects on the thyroid. Here's just another on mercury. Uh, 
Um, so when would you suspect toxins? Certainly by doing a detailed exposure questionnaire in somebody who um, uh, uh, may also have thyroid dysfunction. Uh, you know, a quick but fairly thorough questionnaire is the toxin exposure questionnaire that we have created. It's in your toolkit. Um, it's a simple, quick tool to assess for exposures. Then if you suspect toxins, focus on eliminating or decreasing toxins that affect um, thyroid function. Now, uh, evaluating individual toxins is, um, uh, is difficult uh, from an individual assessment standpoint. So while there are ways to assess individual toxins, at the very least work on the kind of the concept of total toxic load. We're convinced that toxins are a mediator and a trigger of dysfunction. We need to generally decrease exposure and increase elimination. So how do we do that? Well, many ways, filtering water, buying organic, uh, not using uh, many personal care products, uh, using organic fertilizers, focusing on liver support, mobilization and excretion of toxins to reduce that burden, uh, you know, sweating, saunas, exercise, um, you know, think about medications and recall that, uh, you know, 30, 30 some odd percent of Americans take one prescription, uh, maybe 10% or more take three or more prescriptions. So improving the dietary prescription with a focus on detoxification and biotransformation is important from a thyroid perspective. So in summary, what affects thyroid function? I've alluded to reverse T3 a number of times. I'll discuss that uh, shortly. For now, just know that it's, it's as it sounds, it's the opposite of uh, T3. Um, so um, we can see here factors that contribute to proper production of thyroid hormones. Um, uh, so these are production factors. We've talked about many of these. Um, and then we've talked about factors that inhibit the production of T4. We've talked about many of these stress medications, infections, gluten, uh, fluoride, um, you know, uh, toxins, etc. And then we talked about uh, factors that have to do with that conversion of T4 to T3 and uh, this uh, idea of PTSD. Uh, production transport, we're talking about transport here. We know that selenium and zinc increase the conversion of uh, T4 to T3. And, uh, and here are factors in the conversion of T4 to reverse T3. Um, uh, reverse T3 is sometimes referred to as the hibernation hormone, globally slows down the system. Um, so lots of things do this, um, some similar to factors that decrease production, like infections, toxins, stress, but also medications, very low calorie diet, physical trauma, liver dysfunction, etc. And finally, there are factors that affect cellular sensitivity, the S of PTSD. So things like exercise, vitamin A and zinc improve the sensitivity of, uh, of T3 at the receptor level. Um, so here you have this mnemonic that we've uh, I've kind of revisited here. And the point is to think in this way, what stimulates or inhibits production, transport, synthesis, sensitivity, and metabolism or uh, detoxification of thyroid hormones. And here's the overall picture. Again, you have this in your toolkit as well, something I use on a fairly regular basis. So after that overview of what causes the thyroid to go awry, what constellation of signs, symptoms, and laboratory increases your index of suspicion? Let's talk about how to recognize it clinically first. Why do I think signs and symptoms are so important? Because in endocrinology, uh, particularly adrenal thyroid and men and women's hormonal issues, laboratory numbers are useful. They're not perfect labs or guideposts. Uh, signs and symptoms matter a lot because symptomatology is so specific to the individual. 
So a lot of this kind of assessment is finding patterns and symptoms and then using lab to help guide and confirm. But lab may not be definitive. History is important. We put together a specific thyroid questionnaire and I've included, uh, uh, included in it are questions about family or personal history. There is no scoring, however, a three or greater, three or more checks, I get suspicious. Um, so what do these symptoms make you think of? Hypotension, hypoglycemia, poor tolerance uh, to stress, fatigue, hair loss, poor concentration, cold extremities, headaches. Well, you could be thinking of the thyroid, but you also might be wanting to think of iron, iron deficiency, which as I've tried to show, may be underlying thyroid dysfunction. Um, so uh, just to kind of put it in context, don't think everyone has thyroid dysfunction. Um, uh, and it may be an, just an iron deficiency. And you know, when we're talking about uh, premenopausal women, it may be as uh, you know, somewhere between five, maybe even 10% uh, may have a borderline iron deficiency. On a physical exam, you may see various signs suggestive of thyroid dysfunction. I think dry skin, uh, diffuse hair loss, and edema are the most common that I see. In no way does this diagnose low thyroid function to me, but it raises my index of suspicion. So you have a woman with fatigue and PMS, depression, constipation, weight gain. Certainly you think of thyroid uh, dysfunction, think of iron deficiency. Um, uh, what about uh, keratoderma, which I've highlighted here? Keratoderma results from poor, poor conversion of beta carotene to vitamin A. So I uh, talked about that in hypothyroidism. The rate of conversion is reduced. Um, and um, so kerat keratoderma or hyperkeratinemia can occur. I've also highlighted here, lastly, elevated LDL cholesterol. Elevated LDL often makes us think of the base of the matrix, diet and exercise, as we should, but both total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol levels are often increased in patients with hypothyroidism. In those patients, this is due to decreased T3. T3 is necessary for LDL receptor activity. So with low T3 and decreased LDL receptor activity, you get decreased breakdown of LDL, from the bloodstream, and thus higher levels of LDL. So this is why people with hypothyroid and Hashimoto's thyroiditis will commonly have an elevated total cholesterol on a lipid panel, and increasing T4 and or T3 will help to decrease that total cholesterol along with LDL. Those were signs as far as symptoms, I think, fatigue, coldness, cold intolerance, muscle uh, uh, or, or um, arthralgias will all raise my index of suspicion. And I uh, want to highlight depression here, melancholic depression. Think of elevations in cortisol and consequent depression in thyroid hormones. And when you see constipation, then you can think of that um, but uh, as an important sign, but also as I've highlighted gas and bloating, um, how is that associated with thyroid dysfunction? Um, so the question, is there a connection between thyroid dysfunction and gas and bloating and the diagnosis of SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? It appears that gas and bloating and dysmotility may be masquerading as an underlying hypothyroid state. There, uh, this is a study of a few years ago referenced here that reported hypothyroidism significantly uh, was significantly associated with SIBO with a, a pretty significant odds ratio. So these are my top 10, uh, if you will, constellation of um, uh, uh, signs and symptoms uh, that uh, I keep in mind for thyroid dysfunction. And depending on labs and finances, may be one of the primary ways that you may be diagnosing. Um, we talked about history and signs and symptoms. What about basal body temperature? BBD monitoring has been uh, advocated for many years, first by Broda Barnes uh, you know, decades ago, who thought there was a correlation between low basal body temperature and hypothyroid uh, 
And what he said based upon this criteria, as many as 40% of the population was hypothyroid. However, in this paper, the author lists a number of problems with that hypothesis. Uh, that is, there are many other variables to temperature unrelated to thyroid dysfunction. I used to use basal body temperature many years ago, but I found it unhelpful and stopped. And this seems to be the reason, but you'll notice people still coming in talking about basal body temperature. I do use labs often. I'll talk about labs in a, in a moment, but his, this is a well-referenced indexed in the literature score of 30 or greater has a 60% chance without laboratory of being indicative of thyroid dysfunction that can be found online. So after that constellation increases your index of suspicion, what labs would you do? Uh, we'll talk about what labs to do, but first, let's just talk about um, what specimen we should use. I use blood for the following reasons. It's easy, easily available, covered by insurance, easier than a 24-hour year, and much easier, I think. Uh, uh, much, much more documentation than sal saliva or urine, and they have been shown to be more consistent markers with some caveats, which I'll talk about. So now let's discuss TSH and what I term TSH myths. Um, and uh, so um, what about these TSH myths? So the first one is uh, the reference range. Let's look at that more closely. As you know, conventional TSH has been used to define normal and abnormal. I will argue later about another myth that TSH is not the be all and the end all, um, but it is nevertheless important from both a medical and a legal standpoint to use TSH. Therefore, setting the reference range has important implications. And uh, many years ago, the National Academy of um, uh, Clinical Biochemistry issued guidelines for the diagnosis and monitoring of uh, thyroid disease. And they um, essentially said, oh, the TSH, that reference range was too wide. Uh, that uh, 0.5, 5.5, and they cited newer research uh, that uh, excluded uh, individuals with borderline thyroid disease, and uh, a more sensitive screening was performed, and they found 95% of the population tested uh, between 0.4 and 2.5, so it seemed more optimal. And uh, around that time, the American College of Clinical Endocrinology endocrinologists also um, followed suit, if you will. And then to support that, there were two uh, enhanced studies, uh, very large studies suggesting uh, that the ranges were in fact too broad and their conclusion was TSH upper reference limits may be skewed by uh, a thyroid peroxidase antibody negative individuals with occult autoimmune thyroid dysfunction. In other words, they were counting AI, uh, autoimmune thyroiditis as normal in a reference range, so they came to the same conclusion. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many conventional labs and mainstream clinicians haven't adopted these new recommendations, and the debate uh, continues, if you will. Um, so the, you know, the, um, uh, the first conclusion I have is that the reference range is too wide. It's either 0 0.4 to you know, 2 to 2.5, um, somewhere around that is a more optimal reference range, uh, given the fact that uh, TSH is not the be-all and the end-all, as, as I'm, I'll talk about here, which is really this issue of suboptimal versus subclinical. Um, and by this, um, this is really another aspect of defining the hypothyroid uh, disagreements and controversy in the literature. First, we have the question of what is normal as far as the reference range is concerned. Now we kind of leave that aside for the moment. Um, uh, and uh, what if we find TSH outside of the accepted reference range, but we have a normal serum 3T4? That is a name. It's been called subclinical hypothyroid, as I think you all know. And this has caused no end of controversy, 
it really cuts to the very heart of the matter. That is, do we treat a blood test or add some clinical experience to that equation? Subclinical suggests there's no signs and symptoms, no consequences. I think a better question is not um, what is subclinical, um, but what is suboptimal, because I think there are consequences. Well, why? Well, because there's evidence that this subclinical hypothyroid is suboptimal and can lead to clinical issues, and therefore we should be concerned and it should be treated. Uh, the first bit of evidence is that patients with mild thyroid failure progress slowly but predictably to clinical hypothyroidism. So we treat, or we should be treating pre-diabetes, for instance, or pre-hypertension. Therefore, if you treat, you can prevent uh, the morbidity of uh, uh, clinical hypothyroidism, but more specifically, subclinical leads to clinical in a variety of ways, cardiovascular here. Um, <clears throat> so there is good evidence that in subpopulations, it can reduce cardiovascular risk if you um, treat subclinical hypothyroidism. Uh, and really there's accumulating evidence that suggests that SCH is an actionable condition. Again, it only makes sense um, uh, we're, we're treating borderline other things. We, we want to uh, uh, treat a borderline uh, thyroid condition. Now to be balanced or relatively balanced, a controversy is not a controversy if there's not two sides. This is the uh, Cochrane database meta-analysis did not show improved outcomes. However, they did not use T3 therapy, only T4, which I think is an important caveat. So again, dueling meta-analyses. What about reproductive health? We know pregnancy outcomes in infertility improve uh, if you're treating subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, we know that uh, um, cognition improves, at least in those in individuals um, who are uh, uh, younger than 75, cognition does improve. Um, and so what is the second conclusion? Um, and that is TSH in a range considered subclinical, whatever that range is, may not be optimal. And suboptimal TSH is likely to differ from individual to individual. In a patient with suggestive signs and symptoms, testing for thyroid dysfunction is important and we should use a TSH within the optimal reference range as um, a guideline, but one guideline. How about is TSH adequate as a screen? So beyond the deliberation of TSH reference ranges, the question of TSH as the sole diagnostic criteria for thyroid dysfunction. So the question comes down to, is TSH the be all and the end all? Can it do um, all of these things? Can it uh, reflect variations in target cell sensitivity? Can it reflect uh, peripheral T4 to T3 conversion dysfunction? Can uh, it reflect cellular transport problems? and can uh, ref it reflect displacement of thyroid hormones from cellular receptors by reverse T3 or uh, thyroid antibodies or other substances. Um, so, uh, the, you know, so the answer to all these questions I would say is no. TSH is highly sensitive in the sense that it can detect, we can detect TSH down to very low levels, but a highly sensitive TSH is a bit of a misnomer. It isn't highly sensitive to detect thyroid hormones throughout the body. So the question comes down to, is TSH, uh, as I say, the, the be all and the end all? And this is not a new concept. For many years, medicine has uh, really been grappling with the diagnosis, uh, the usefulness of TSH alone. And as this article states, we should not confuse a population reference range with an individual's optimal range. Reference ranges are crude parameters. 
uh, for detecting disease in the individual. And, um, you know, the European Thyroid Association doesn't think that TSH is the ultimate diagnostic criteria. And really the, the bottom line is testing TSH indicates only pituitary production and pituitary hormone levels alone are not sufficient to measure the function of the gland they regulate. So our last conclusion about TSH and dispelling myths is that um, using only TSH is inadequate to assess suboptimal thyroid function. And I will also follow up with another study later that will significantly reinforce why you may want to use other laboratory. So the analogy I often use with patients to describe the inadequacy of TSH is by saying, when you go to the shoe store to buy a pair of shoes, you need to find the right shoe size. You need to find the right shoe for your foot. There is a normal shoe size um, for men or women, uh, but there's only one size that fits best for you, the individual. So you need to find an optimal fit within the reference range. Now let's look at the rest of the preliminary lab workup. I want to clarify, TSH is still on the list. We're not throwing the baby out with bathwater for legal as well as uh, um, scientific evidence-based reasons. Um, uh, but uh, we need to be thinking about doing other things as I list there. What other tests uh, to order in addition to TSH will here we say free T3 and free T4, which are the best way to assess the activity of thyroid hormones. Is it necessary to test both? Conventionally, it's thought that it's only necessary to test for T4 as T4 is converted to T3, but that's only true if T4 is converted to T3 at a consistent rate in all individuals. And as you will see, that's just not true. This is um, uh, well, the, the study I was uh, alluding to. So the question is, do normal TSH and T4 levels actually reflect normal serum T3? And I think this is a very important paper and proves the point that it does not. They took 1,800 plus patients without a thyroid gland and on T4 replacement, maintain within a TSH normal range, um, actually maintain within, a, a, as you'll see, a TS, TSH optimal range and compare them to 3,800 controls who had been screened for no thyroid dysfunction. TSH was essentially the same. And as I say, this looks, you know, optimal in terms of the ranges that I just described to you. However, in those patients on T4 replacement, when they measured free T3, they found that over 15% were below the normal range. But more surprising, a ratio of T3 to T4, uh, alluded to that ratio, was almost 30% of those tested was, was below the normal range. So what does that mean? At the very least, that not everyone on T4 converts in the same way to T3. So their conclusions were a subset of patients do not reach a serum free T3, free T4 ratio within the reference range observed in youth thyroid controls. And so these patients who don't reach that ratio uh, live in a chronic condition of abnormal thyroid hormone availability for the peripheral tissues, even if the administrated uh, uh, T4 dose is able to maintain the serum TSH within the normal range. And um, they, went, uh, they went on to say that the insufficient T3 peripheral production cannot be appropriately corrected by increasing T4 dose because the inhibitory effect of elevated T3 on these, again, these deionase enzymes will end up increasing the imbalance of the circulating ratio. Again, I'll talk about these deionase a little bit more in a moment. So overall, their conclusions, uneven conversion among patients from T4 to T3, T4 may be giving signals to the pituitary that don't reflect serum T3, 
or intracellular T3 levels. TSH and T4 alone do not reflect adequacy in thyroid metabolism for a subset of patients. And this idea is gaining support uh, more in Europe. Um, note that they've turned this ratio around. They're talking about the same thing. They're talking about free T4, free T3 ratio, but it's the same concept. Now, another important point, T4 has options, and the other option is to go to this uh, thing that I've alluded to, this hormone that I've alluded to, reverse T3. I showed you before that T4, T4 converts to T3, but it can also, through the deionase D3 enzyme, convert to reverse T3. So let's review here. <clears throat> we can see that the pituitary uh, produces TSH, the thyroid gland then produces uh, primarily T4, the liver and kidney, um, through these diatomies enzymes, uh, break that down or uh, transform that to active or uh, inactive, uh, reverse T3 or T3, and that goes to the cell nucleus. And then, so um, if you don't have a thyroid gland, you're not producing any T3. So the point here is converting T4 to T3 is optional. Uh, the body determines that conversion for T4 to T3 or reverse T3, and our body has the option to increase or decrease its metabolic rate. So we have a way to regulate energy use. Of course, that makes a lot of sense um, physiologically. So reverse T3 slows down metabolism, and we want to slow down metabolism when we're starving, uh, when we're threatened with an illness, uh, an injury, etc. And there's a lot of literature to, to support this. Um, and this review of the stressors um, does suggest there's a continuum. It's not just... Uh, uh, one, uh, you know, uh, that we go from zero to 60. There's a continuum of slowing down metabolism. And it's not usually helpful to keep a slow metabolism. Our body's protective or adaptive responses become harmful or maladaptive if continued for too long or if used at the wrong time. What determines the fate of T4? As I mentioned, there are three deionase enzymes involved in these. In this conversion, we are primarily interested in D1 and D3. There are two ways D1 increases T3 availability. It converts T4 to T3 and it converts or biotransforms reverse T3 to its inactivated form of T2, which I show right here. There are two ways by which D3 decreases T3 availability. It prevents conversion of T4 to T3 by catalyzing the conversion of T4 to reverse T3 uh, instead, and it catalyzes the degradation of um, T3 to T2, as I show here. Therefore, D1 revs the engine by increasing T3. D3 hits the brakes by increasing reverse T3, and importantly, this process is competitive. The conversion is this pivotal area we should be aware of. We talked about some of these inhibitors of uh, D1, and as I point, T2 as well. And so therefore, one can have excessive reverse T3 levels with potentially normal T3. Resulting not in low T3, but in a low T3 reverse T3 ratio, the normal amount of T3 produced is not adequate to overcome the inhibitory effects of reverse T3. So this concept has been overlooked because we um, kind of have uh, ignorance or we don't pay as, or we haven't paid as much attention to reverse T3. There's this dogma that T4 will always convert adequately to T3. 
and then there's this reliance on uh, TSH as the sole diagnostic criteria. And just to give you, you know, uh, an idea with, with the kind of information we know about genetic variation, as I've listed here, how can we possibly say that some patients don't have problems with this conversion, let alone all those other environmental uh, factors that I mentioned there uh, before? Therefore, for all these reasons, I routinely assess reverse T3 in patients I suspect of thyroid dysfunction. To get an idea of this competition between T3 and reverse T3, a ratio between the two has been used. So while free T3 is the most accurate, I get total T3 as the literature has looked at total T3. Ratios in general, I think, are useful because we can get around this reliance on some of these faulty or, or um, these reference ranges that which are not optimal. So again, there are references on, on both of these ratios, uh, this uh, T3, uh, I'm sorry, free T3, uh, free T4, and this total T3, the reverse T3 ratio. Um, and the higher the ratio, the higher the activity, the lower the ratio, the lower the activity. I'll show you uh, some numbers in a moment. You don't always want to override uh, the break on reverse T3, you have to understand that stress, are you dealing with the adrenals? So um, sometimes you do want to stop um, and you, you want to work, look upstream. Therefore, there are two important reasons to go beyond T4. Is T4 converting to T3 in the serum, and therefore you assume driving the metabolic machinery of the cell? To know, you need to assess T3 and the ratio T3, T4, or free T3, free T4. And then has too much T4 been converted to reverse T3, and therefore even with normal T3 serum levels, there may be a metabolic block to its action, to know you need to, res to assess reverse T3 and the ratio of T4 to reverse T3. So filling out finally this thyroid panel that I've talked about is thyroid antibodies. Um, and 70 to 80% of hypothyroid individuals have thyroid antibodies. Most of them are women, and I think we should be assessing for antibodies. So, why? Well, because patients with elevated antibodies and everything else normal have more problems. That's the likely reason. Again, individuals with normal labs except thyroid antibodies have symptoms. So elevated antibodies are associated with depression, et cetera. And so we should be testing for antibodies. Be aware also that autoimmune thyroid disease is secondary to uh, these various things that we've talked about. And another reason to test for thyroid autoimmune disease is that it's a clue or it will clue you into the need to assess for other autoimmune diseases. So this is important as, as this uh, uh, figure, individuals with Hathimodos have about a 15% chance of having a second autoimmune disease. Um, uh, so it suggests to me that it's not necessarily the modification of thyroid hormones, but that persons, uh, a person's unwellness may be secondary to another autoimmune disease that can be treated. So if you recall, Alessio Fasano, he talked about uh, genetic propensity, a trigger and barrier effects. Um, so we need to be looking at autoimmune diseases in general if we have Hashimoto's. And of course, looking at uh, uh, dysbiosis and intestinal permeability as uh, really as Dr. Vasano has, has uh, bring, brought us towards. So here's the baseline testing summary that I think is an overview of production, processing, uh, indication of where things are off and what, where points of leverage might be. And here's the optimal and standard reference ranges with those ratios.
And finally, here's the rest of the story in terms of the laboratory workup. And I've alluded to all of these. Um, so we have talked about iron, CBC and ferritin, talked about zinc, we look at RBC zinc, talked about talked about selenium, I look at RBC selenium or whole blood glutathione, vitamin D, which I often get 25 OH vitamin D, uh, vitamin D is uh, serum vitamin A. Now, um, some of these I order, as you can see, more often than others. Uh, vitamin D often, iodine often, as as you can see, vitamin A not so often, but I often have supplement with lower levels of vitamin A. Um, so uh, celiac disease is, um, you know, the rest part of the rest of the story. Food sensitivities, part of the rest of the story. Toxic minerals can be part of the rest of the story as indicated. Even uh, breath testing for SIBO may be part of the rest of the story. So given all this, when should you then suspect thyroid dysfunction? When should you test or when should you even screen? And one would assume perhaps that there may be unanimity in the conventional medical community. There is one conventional way to do this. Um, well, as these following slides suggest, that's just not the case. Um, different uh, academies have uh, many different uh, recommendations. The American College of Physicians, the American Academy of Family Physicians, all different. The American Academy of, or the American Thyroid Association, U.S. Prevention Services Task Force, Rural College of Physicians uh, say it's unjustified. American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists uh, say one thing. College of American Pathologists say another thing. Uh, the uh, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists have other standards. And finally, I put in Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health, which say a high index of suspicion of clinical suspicion should be maintained, and then you should be thinking about uh, testing, uh, which I would suggest we follow. Um, it's to um, you know uh, be thinking about conditions that warrant as, as it says here, aggressive case finding and all of these conditions listed and others that I've alluded to um, makes me uh, much more aggressively assessing for a thyroid dysfunction. Again, we put together this specific thyroid questionnaire and included important questions about family or personal history that may help in this aggressive case finding. And then finally, um, you know, how do you treat short of HRT, which we'll talk about in the, uh, um, in the uh, live program, uh, the Hormone Advanced Practice Module live virtual program. Um, so I think I've gone through this, kind of given you clues. And so first you need to look at uh, nutrition and review the nutrients for optimal function of production of T4 and T3 and conversion of T4 and T3. You need to look to uh, eliminate uh, toxins or medications that affect thyroid dysfunction. You need to uh, improve or minimize disease states that affect thyroid function. I talked about celiac disease, uh, uh, inflammatory conditions, food sensitivities, uh, and, and decreasing chronic stress, chronic inflammation with uh, regular sleep, exercise, meditation, mindfulness, obviously. And then um, uh, there are diet and lifestyle changes that I'll talk about here, um, and then uh, supplementation we've already talked about. Let's talk about diet and, and lifestyle. So I'm not minimizing these foundational aspects. I, I want to reinforce their importance. This is the bottom of the matrix and foundational lifestyle factors. Um, and most evidence uh, rests with these uh, foundational factors. Um, and these are the three areas to focus on, I think, uh, uh, around gut dysbiosis, overall inflammation, as I talked about before, and, and food reactions that can cause overall inflammation. So what do you do there? Well, you start, or I often start, with an elimination diet, or, um, or from a stress perspective, what's the best diet? Well, there isn't one for everyone, but uh, you may start with a cardiometabolic food plan. Uh, 
as uh, as noted here. And and uh, what about if toxins are an issue? Focused on eliminating, certainly doing elimination diet, and then following up with uh, 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 the detox food plan um, to uh, decrease toxins that affect thyroid function. And again, as I just said, that's the detox food plan. So. Uh, the overall treatment strategy from a diet and lifestyle depends on what's going on with that individual. And then from a supplemental style, not style, from a supplemental standpoint, we're talking about uh, really these supplements that I just went over, um, selenium, zinc, iron, iodine, vitamin D, vitamin A, testing, treating, uh, using food as medicine, using supplementation. Those are from foundational standpoint. I hope you get the idea that um, we're looking at lifestyle factors and and uh, nutraceuticals, and um, uh, that really I think can be a, a very important uh, foundational pillar, or the the important foundational pillar uh, to build upon when we talk about what we'll do um, around these other nutraceuticals, botanicals and uh, hormone replacement therapy when we uh, talk at the, uh, at the virtual program. And so finally, I'll just leave you with um, uh, a quote from William Osler, um, or Osler, and um, uh, he is, um, or was, I should say, a brilliant clinician and writer and thinker. Um, one of uh, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, founding uh, doctors and he wrote a great many wise things and uh, this is one of them if it were not for the great variability among individuals medicine might as well be a science and not an art um, so I will leave you with that and I look forward to um, connecting with you on our virtual program in, uh, in a couple of weeks Oh, 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 oh,